Zoom is crazy. So um, my name is Anna Lee. I am going to spend less than the next couple of hours or so with you just to talk to you about aging plans. Um, let me introduce myself. Um, I'm a social worker. I was a social worker in long-term care facilities for 18 years. And back then in the 90s, we didn't have separate um, we didn't have separate people to do admissions, to do marketing, to do administrative work. Back then, one person did all of it. So part of my job was to do marketing and tours. So every day I had families in my office because there was a medical crisis with their family, right? So mom had a stroke or dad had a stroke or mom tripped and she broke her hip. And so every day there were families that came in because they were panicking. It was usually the adult children were panicking because they didn't know what their options were and they didn't know what to do. I would spend about an hour doing the tour. You know, here's what the rooms are. Here's where the beauty shop is. Here's where you're going to go for rehab or your loved one is going to go for therapy. Um, but I was spending three hours, two and three hours at a time with each family because they had so many questions. So many people think Medicare is gonna pay for everything. When I would ask if your loved one has their end of life wishes, their do not resuscitate or their resuscitation, um, they didn't know. They didn't know if their loved one had long-term care insurance. Yeah. I think this went out. I think it just went out. No, no, no. I thought we were getting some buzzing from it, so I turned it down a little bit. So, so anyway, families just didn't know what what to respond or how to respond. They didn't know if their loved one had long-term care insurance. They didn't know if their father was a veteran and receiving aid and attendance benefits. They didn't know if their parents had their end of life wishes planned out. They didn't know if their loved one had power of attorney documents or living will documents in place. So I realized after 18 years of always working with families in crisis that families are not talking. They're not talking about the what ifs of aging and not even just the what ifs of aging, but the what ifs of life. So we're going to talk about Sheboygan. So I'm a national speaker on aging issues. I speak all across the globe about aging and crisis management and how to facilitate your family meeting and why this is all important. So I just get back from Shenzhen in Beijing, China from speaking at a conference there. Then I'm in Chicago for a week on a speaking tour about aging. And then I'm in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. <laughs> it's a beautiful place. So I'm in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, and I'm walking up the street and I encounter a, a little elderly man who's just kind of putzing along. And I'm from Iowa. We're friendly people there. So I always say, hello, how are you? And I asked him how he is, and I got this long, long, very long <laughs> laundry list of what his health issues are. The long and the short of it is he had just had three heart stints put in about six months before. So he was still moving pretty slowly. So I said, well, let me just walk with you. He's very red. <laughs> and I said, let me just walk with you to make sure that you get to where you're going, because we were kind of sort of going in the same direction. And so we get to the intersection as pedestrians and we're waiting for the light to change where the little green legs say that you can go. And so we go and he's still telling me about his health issues. So all of a sudden he yells, watch out. And the next thing I know, I'm getting up off the street and I'm like, what the heck? What the heck just happened here? So I'm getting up off the street I'm looking around, there's broken glass, there's broken reflectors all across the street. And I'm just like, what the heck just happened here? So then I look up further and there's a school bus parked crooked across the street. 
she was distracted by the 29 kids on the school bus. And instead of looking through the windshield as she was going through the intersection, she was looking up in that little mirror thing on it to look inside the bus. And so she did not apply the brakes until she saw my face break the headlight of the school bus. So this is four, literally four days after my 40th birthday. Okay, this was May 2nd of 2012. Care right, my business was one year old almost to the day. And you have to think about if any of you are business owners or have been business owners, it is a lot of work to grow and scale a business. And my business, when I first opened Care Right, it just really kind of exploded because no one's talking about aging plans and no one's doing what I do. And so to have to um to have to start my business over because it took me about eight months to recover because I had broken ribs, I had obviously traumatic facial injuries and had to have reconstruction surgery. So this side of my face, I should age pretty well because <laughs> it's all titanium holding it all together. <laughs> but it took me a long time to recover, even at my age, right? And back then I was running, like running 30 miles a week. I was, I was in good shape, but it took me, back then I was in good shape, but it, but it took me almost a year to recover. My first speaking engagement after my bus accident was with a group of social workers, which is great because that's what I am. And you can't find, you'll never find a more like forgiving audience because I still couldn't feel my face yet. <laughs> and I was still having to do like eye drops every 10 minutes because my eyes haven't closed anymore like it should. So I was like, you guys, <laughs> you are your most forgiving audience. So. My point in sharing that is that when we talk about planning, it's not just for elderly people, everybody. Do you think I woke up four days after my 40th birthday thinking, huh, I think I'm going to get hit by a school bus today and have my life in every single way be totally uprooted and devastated? No, I did not wake up. But there's a really cool chocolate store on the corner of whatever street that is in Sheboygan. And fortunately, the day before I got hit by the bus, that's why you have to live each day for every day because you don't know what that's going to look like <laughs> the following day. So the day before I got hit by the school bus, I actually stopped at this chocolate store and I like chocolate, so I had like six of them. But now I'm glad I did because that was actually my last meal <laughs> for like eight months. <laughs> So thank God I stopped at that chocolate store. So, <laughs> so anyway, um, so it's important to be thinking and talking, not only thinking about things, but talking about the what ifs with your family. So when I was still working as an employee, before I started my company, like I said, families just are not talking about these things. And so I started my company in 2011 because because I see for, I had 18 years of baseline to know that 90% of families are not talking about the important things of aging and the important things of life. I would have families that said every single time I'd ask them questions, Anna Lee, our family doesn't talk about stuff like that. It never occurred to me to ask dad if he's a veteran or it never occurred to me to ask about long-term care insurance. Um, the spouses, because it wasn't always the adult children, although most of the time it was, who was coming in for a tour. And so the reality is that spouses don't tend to communicate about these things either. So I'd have a lot of wives that would say, I don't know what we have in place for insurance. My husband takes care of all of that. So if that's in, if you're in that situation, you may want to you may want to be thinking about that so that you're not left vulnerable if something happens to your spouse if he's the one that's always taking care of the business part of the marriage so so my why it's pretty it's pretty important to to talk about aging and to talk about what your goals are if you want to have quality of life and quality of options quality care options and quality relationships with your adult children. 
So crisis families every single day, they would say, we never talked about this kind of stuff, Anna Lee. It never occurred to us to talk about it. But then I'd have a few families, a few adult children that would come and say, you know, Anna Lee, I tried to have these conversations with mom and dad, but they gave us so much pushback because they didn't want to talk about it, that they quit trying. And guess what? So they quit trying because they wanted to save their relationship with their kid or with their parents, right? But now mom is in crisis and now what are the kids supposed to do? They're supposed to make big decisions on their parents' behalf and they have no idea what to even decide about. They don't know what's in place. And because they haven't talked about maybe end of life or if I have a stroke, this is what I want us to do as a family. So kids and spouses had no idea. It caught this crisis, caught families completely off guard. And so I thought, hmm, there has to be a better way. So that's why I started Care Right, is to help families plan ahead and have these conversations sooner rather than later. The reality is, what do you think the bulk of my families come to me as? Proactive families or crisis families? Crisis for sure. Like 92% of my families come to me in crisis. 85% of those 92%, by the time families come to me, they're burned out. Um, the kids aren't getting along anymore. And so 85% of those families, I have to do family mediation because they're so burned out. Adult kids have their own ideas of how their inheritance should be spent. And they have their own, I always get some chuckles about that, <laughs> but it's true. And adult children also have their own ideas of how well things are really going with their parents. And most of the time, um, especially with frail elderly parents, things are not going as well at home as the adult kids would like to think that they are. So the kicker of that is that 33% of those families that are now in crisis, I actually met with them at least twice in the last year before they were really in crisis, but it takes apparently a certain amount of significant pain and discomfort for people to finally put a plan in place. My hope, the reason I do these speaking engagements is to say, don't wait until you're in crisis. What, do you, what kind of options do you think you have when you choose to wait until you're in a crisis situation of any kind? Do you think you have better options when you're in crisis? Or do you think you have better options and it's easier if you plan ahead? plan ahead. And that's true in any case, right? Like before you retired, you probably didn't think at age 62, oh, I'm going to retire in four or five years. I should probably start planning for retirement, right? You plan ahead. That's why I need the top on. <laughs> you plan ahead because you can't just find a, a miracle worker, financial advisor and say, okay, I'm going to retire in four years. Make this magic work for me. And if you do have that kind of financial planner, let me know, because <laughs> I would like that person too. <laughs> so it's just true in any, in any capacity in life, the more you plan ahead, the better outcomes you're gonna have. A good example is just even down here in season. If you wanna go to a nice restaurant, what do you need to do? Go in the summer, but you have to plan ahead and get a reservation, right? I mean, that's just, you're going to have a better option. If you want a quality restaurant, you have to plan and you have to have a reservation. There's always Subway, there's always McDonald's, but that's not what you want, right? But that's what you get when you choose to wait until you're in a crisis situation. All right. So the aging process, it can be bumpy. See, it's hard sometimes for my young, active, vibrant, attendees like you because you're all playing golf and tennis and stuff like that right or at least you're out and about and you're active it's hard to it's hard to wrap your mind around the time where you're not able to get around like you are the aging process can be bumpy a lot of things can happen strokes can happen a fall can happen and you don't plan on it but a fall could happen you could hit your head on the edge of something and, and then your whole plan of whatever it is your retirement plan was completely shifts or changes completely, right? And what happens to one person in a family 
affects everybody. So if, if I, when I had my medical crisis, do you think that when I got hit by the school bus, do you think that it just affected me? No, because I'm single. I have my family it was in Iowa. They don't really handle Milwaukee um, traffic, right? When you're from a small town and then you have to drive into Milwaukee, that's really hard. So I ended up needing to move to Iowa with my parents and my parents were the ones that took care of me and got me to Mayo for my surgeries and got me to all of my follow-up appointments and all those kind of things. So one crisis doesn't just affect one person in the family, it affects everybody. My Because I practice what I preach, I have my living will, my health care power of attorney, my financial power of attorney. So, and because I have my grab and go binder, which we'll talk about, I have everything that my family needs to know about me personally and both of my businesses in the grab and go binder so that in the event something happens to me, they don't have to scramble trying to find accounts and passwords and who my financial planner is and who my attorney is and what the code is to unlock my phone, right? So, so those are just important things to be thinking about is what do you already have in place? So it's bumpy, falls, strokes, dementia, diabetes, cancer, all sorts of things can happen when you least expect it. You'd hope that aging brings families together, but I'm here to tell you that it does not. And if your family or your adult children, if their relationships with each other or with you are already fractured or dicey, it's not going to get better if there's a crisis it will make it worse. It, aging and crises do not bring families together as a rule. If families don't invest the time, the effort, the energy, and the resources required to maintain their relationships with each other, then when that medical crisis happens, then they have to get reacquainted as a family, right? So I always think about when I first started as a social worker, now 25 years ago, I could go to Ethel and Marvin's house. The kids could easily gather around the kitchen table and we could talk this stuff through, right? But how many of you have kids like right down the street from you now? They're all across the country, right? So just like me, my I live in Estero, but my, my dad and mom now live with me and I'll share that. But, um, but my, my one sister lives in Wisconsin and my other, and my brother lives in Iowa. So, if we didn't invest as a family the time and energy, and it takes energy and effort to maintain relationships with each other, then when a crisis happens, it's not good as siblings to try to figure out, okay, now what are we supposed to do with mom and dad if the kids haven't even talked for two years? I have families that their nieces and nephews have never met because they all started moving away and they don't even know their own family members really anymore. That's kind of sad. So. So it's really important to maintain those relationships. I have adult children that don't realize how bad their parents are doing because think about, think about jobs these days. You only get two or four weeks of vacation, right? So if you have two aging parents and then you, your spouse has a set of aging parents, there's only so much vacation time to go around. So there's no just, hey, I'm gonna fly down and pop in on mom and dad to make sure they're okay. So that's why these adult kids end up being blindsided by a medical crisis because they don't really realize how poorly their parents might be doing. Let's talk about Hurricane Irma, for example. So because I offer a free consult, right? So I have all these people that want to do the free consult, which is good. And their goals are always to age in place at home and stay at home until they die. That's most people's goal, right? So her, and they, they don't even want to sometimes talk about the what ifs because nobody wants, nobody's excited about talking about if you have a medical crisis, but guess what? Medical hospitals are full of medical crises patients every single day. So Hurricane Irma hits and I have all of these um, families who were like, oh no, mom and dad were doing fine, you know, before Hurricane Irma. Mom and dad were doing fine. I just, I call on them once a month and they sound like they're doing okay on the phone. So Hurricane Irma hits, and a lot of these adult children moved their parents up temporarily up north to get out of harm's way, right? So they had mom and dad staying with them, and my phone literally rings off the hook, although I guess it's 
not on the wall anymore, but you know what I mean. <laughs> my phone rings off the hook because I have all these adult children who brought their parents up up north and some of them didn't realize that their dad was so demented that he didn't take his pills for a, a week or they didn't realize that mom was so unsteady or her Parkinson's had gotten worse and she fell every day that she was there or the kids didn't think about their house isn't senior safe they have steps to get up to the garage they have steps they have steps everywhere or they don't have grab bars or they don't have walk-in showers so my phone was, I was very busy after Hurricane Irma because that's what it took sometimes to wake the adult kids up and their parents to say, look, we have to put a plan together. So it's just, it's really important stuff. And it's not, you know, it's not bad stuff to talk about. It should be energizing because if you want to have choice, you have to talk about it. Otherwise, guess who is going to make decisions for you if you don't have anything in place and you haven't talked to your kids about it? Guess who's going to make your choices for you? So think about think about how that's going to look. Everyone in the family has their own unique relationship with each other, and relationships change through the course of time. Like, look at your own family. How have your relationships with each of your children changed through the course of time? Because they probably have. And think about your your children. All of your children, how have their relationships with each other as siblings changed through the course of time? Maybe they were close, maybe your two daughters were close together, um, but now through the course of time and they moved away from each other and they don't talk as much. So relationships are going to um, be very much impacted through the aging process and certainly through a medical crisis. I don't usually see people at their best because again, they're coming to me in crisis, right? So when you're in crisis mode, you're scared, you're overwhelmed, you're not sure what your options are, and you're not sure how you're going to pay for things because Medicare doesn't pay for what most people think it does. So people are scared and, and the best way to prevent that is to start the conversations now and get that, get that plan put together. But they wait until they're in crisis. So no one in 25 years has ever come back to me and said, Anna Lee, I feel so confident and so great about the decisions that our family had to make in the midst of a crisis. Nobody has ever come back to me and said that. So questions so far. Because now we're going to get down to the nuts and bolts of numbers for those that are like that, that like numbers. So Genworth did a study in 2018. And I like that the insurance companies are starting to kind of come around a bit and say, hey, look, we have an aging nation out there and we have a lot of family caregivers out there. We should probably start doing some research and see what kind of solutions that we might be able to put in place. So Genworth found that 46% of family caregivers, the adult children, had to work fewer hours because they had aging parents. 30% of family caregivers missed career opportunities 63% of family caregivers are paying for their loved one's care out of their own funds. And I know that sometimes when you're able-bodied and active like you are, you're like, this will never happen to me, but it does, it can happen. And I want you to be prepared. 42% of family caregivers reduce their contributions to their own savings and retirement because they have to adjust their own quality of life and their own standard of living when they have aging parents, they might have to keep flying back and forth to check in on or come to the rescue every time there's an issue or a medical crisis. There's another insurance, I tell you, is waking up to this. <laughs> so there's another insurance company that did another study. They found that 58% of adult children found themselves thrust into the role of family caregiving without ever having any kind of family discussion about it. Aging 2.0, that's a healthcare, um, that's a healthcare membership I'm part of. They did a study and they found that 48% of seniors, when they get discharged from the hospital, they don't follow through with the hospital discharge instruction. And why do you think that is? No one, there's no one to coordinate their care and follow up to make sure that they got to their appointments. And when you're in the hospital, if you've ever been in the hospital, 
believe me, when I was at Mayo, you think I was like so hung out on drugs because I had so much pain. Do you think that I would have been able to call appointments and schedule transportation? Because obviously I couldn't drive for about a year because as soon as I'd have one face surgery, it'd have to heal and then I'd have to have another face. So I couldn't drive. So my parents had to coordinate everything. And so when you're in the hospital you're and you just get out, do you think hospitals keep you until you're recovered? No, <laughs> their job when you get in there is to get you out. So, so when, when you get discharged from the hospital, you're still not feeling very well. And maybe at this point, your kids might've had to go back up north because they have to get back to work or their families and so forth. So 48% of seniors don't, they're just not able to follow through on their follow-up discharge paperwork. So we're gonna talk about what happened. So my parents, I'm very, very close to my family. Like we are just a really tight knit family. That's how we were raised. And that's how my parents were raised. So that's how they raised us. So we're a very tight knit family. Like I said, I'm from Iowa, but I had moved to Milwaukee and started my own company. And then eight years ago, well now, where did time go? <laughs> 10 years ago, I opened up my office in Bonita. And I would fly back and forth for a week at a time during each month of season. And then I fell in love with Bonita and I fell in love with the area down here because why wouldn't you when you come from the Midwest and it's cold up there? So I decided that my new strategy was going to figure out how can I move to like Bonita, Estero, Naples area. So I worked on my strategic plan and I moved within three years. And I've been in, in, in Bonita now for four years as a resident for four years. But when I moved, I always, I always budgeted that I would still fly up north every four to five weeks to spend time with my siblings and spend time with my family. My dad has been my mom's caregiver. My dad, my dad has been always a family man. My mom got early onset dementia when she was about 62-ish, 65. We started seeing just some little things that were a bit off with her and my dad has been her full-time caregiver for at least 10 years full-time so he took over all the cooking cleaning laundry bill pay because my mom used to be an accountant and so she did all of the bills and took care of the mail and stuff like that so my dad had to really change roles he had to figure out how to run the washing machine and the dishwasher he had to figure out how to cook so it really, this is a real life experience of what can happen. So my, my mom and dad decided to come down with me in 2019. I said, why don't you guys spend the winter with me like you did the year before? Because my mom's dementia wasn't progressed to the point where she couldn't handle traveling. If, if you understand dementia, they really do not do well with changes at all in their environment, their routine, like you have to keep it consistent if you want them to be as successful as possible. Well, they came down and two weeks after they got down here in 2019, they, my mom fell and she broke her shoulder. And if you understand how dementia works, when you have a trauma to your body and you have dementia, it can definitely progress the dementia to that next level or that next phase and it definitely did that for my mom so two weeks after she falls she gets discharged from the hospital she has like literally 18 specialist follow-up appointments because now she has a catheter she has she had like a, a specialist for every single body part right she's got an orthopedic surgeon now because she's got to have surgery so I'm literally admitting my mom to the skilled rehab unit and I look over and this is right before Christmas, it's December 18th of, of not last year, but the year before. So I look over because I'm like, dad, here's a list of stuff to get at Target so we can decorate mom's room for Christmas. And he's not responding and it's, you know, hospitals, they don't just discharge you at breakfast time so you have a whole day to prepare. So they had discharged her at like eight o'clock at night that's what hospitals do or they'll discharge you at midnight or two o'clock in the morning whenever it is that they need to open up that bed for another patient that's how it works in healthcare. Mm -hmm. so that's why i do patient advocacy too <laughs> so anyway so they discharge her at like eight o'clock at night so i'm handing dad this um list 
And we are both exhausted because hospitals are not trained properly for dementia patients. And if we weren't there literally every waking moment of my mom's time there, she would not have gotten the care she needed. And that's something that families need to know. If you go in these hospitals, you if you can't advocate for yourself, you better have somebody who will. So we were both exhausted. Turns out my dad is unresponsive. He's not taking the list for me because he's unresponsive. So he's having a stroke. So just as I realized, because I'm literally unpacking mom in her dresser drawer, and I look over and dad's like this, right? And so I'm like, holy crap, because he's also diabetic. And I thought maybe he was really low because he goes really low, really quick. And it turns out he was having a stroke. Well, just as I realized my dad is not in a good way, the nurse in the rehab center comes in and she's like, you guys have to go because we're here to do your mom's skin assessment. And I said, well, I'm sorry, but my dad is having an issue here. She's like, well, I'm sorry, that's too bad. You have to get him out of here and you have to bring me. So I'm like, I don't even know what to do because like my mom has dementia. She's in a brand new environment. She's freaking out. I've got my dad who is now having a stroke and he's like unresponsive. So I literally have to get a wheelchair, transfer my six foot three father, who's tall, thank God I take after him and tall, but I transfer my dad who's lethargic and unresponsive into a wheelchair, which is not recommended. And I have to wheel him up to the front door. This is the first time I've been in this rehab center and I have no idea where the front door even is anymore. So I'm like trying to find, and my dad's like this in the chair. And it's because the nurse wouldn't help me. She goes, I'm sorry, but you have to do this. We're not responsible for your dad because he's not our patient. So I'm like, so I'm calling the paramedics. They come and get him. But my point in all of this is, so I got mom who's discharged from the hospital who literally has 18 appointments and they're all time they're all time sensitive because you got catheter, you have surgery, you have all these time sensitive appointments. So I'm literally having to leave my mom who just got admitted into a skilled rehab. And then I'm gonna be at my, with my dad at Gulf Coast Hospital for three days while they figure out how bad the stroke is and tests and stuff like that. So then he gets discharged and he, he has about 15 appointments too. And I'm the only one down here. And I run two businesses and I all I do is crisis management with families, right? <laughs> Hence all these little gray hairs that probably are popping out all over the place. So my point in that is it's really overwhelming when you have one parent, let alone two parents, like go down quickly like that. And you're the only person around. Thankfully, I was around because of all my of my siblings, I'm the one that has, in theory, the most flexibility because I don't have kids or a spouse <laughs> to have to like navigate, right? Um, but it's overwhelming having a crisis, but it wasn't as overwhelming as it could have been because why we had an aging plan in place. We have been talking about the what ifs for years. What if dad has a stroke? What if he has a heart attack? What if, well, there's no what if. When you have dementia, it will progress and it's not going to be pretty. So we've been talking about aging and where they're going to live, who's gonna take care of them, what do they have in place to pay for care for years? Because I know what I know, because I do what I do for a living. So we already had an aging plan and we had to initiate it. When you're in a crisis, the hospital needs about 15 things from you or your kids. And if you can't provide it, somebody has to. Like insurance cards, like social security number, like what do you have for insurance? They have to have all that stuff. I have my grab and go binder, which I wish I would have brought with me, but <laughs> I have my grab and go binder. So I was literally like I was in the court of law. They're like insurance cards, boom, here's a copy front and back because they need copies front and back. So they're like, we need the living will. And I'm like, here you go. We need the health care for both of them, right? <laughs> Here's the health care power of attorney for mom and dad. How many of you can say that if you had a, had, a, had a situation like this, that your kids would be able to just easily provide what the hospital needs? Yay. Yay. And yay. And yay-ish. And I'll tell you that ish, because <laughs> when I was talking about your coming here, I said that you when my husband and I were still in New York, we paid a lot of money for an elder care attorney to do a grab exactly what you're talking about. But it's in New York. Right. And I have since found out that 
a lot of what's in that binder is not legal in Florida. Correct. Can you repeat that so they can? Yes. Sure. So I'm glad you brought that up. This was not even planned <laughs> because this, this is what happens, especially down here when we are in such a seasonal state. So what Linda was saying is that she has a lot of this information already gathered, but it's in New York, which doesn't do you any good if you're down here and you get hit by a semi and now you can't make your own decisions and the kids are supposed to like make them for you or your husband is supposed to make, make them for you. So wherever you go, your binder needs to go. What most families do when they buy the grab and go binder, just like with me, I have my binder for being only one person, it's very thick, but it's also because I have two businesses and with each business I have a corporate attorney, a corporate CPA, I have accounts and passwords and subscriptions to Zoom and to constant contacts and QuickBooks. And so like just my goal is to make my family's life easier, but also it's one thing to have all your documents in order, which is good. You're already ahead of the game there. But what most people forget to do is take it that next step and actually have a conversation with your family about, hey, here's what I have for insurance. Here's what it covers. Here's what I have for funeral plans. This is what my wishes are. So a lot of people will have because they think that if they went to an elder law attorney and they have a financial plan, that that's all they have to do for planning. And while that's great to have those in place, that's only a, that's only this much of an actual aging plan. So the don't forget that if you're going to gather all of your documents, make sure that they're updated and make sure that if you're traveling that you bring it with you or what most people do is they scan everything in so that they have it electronically and they also give their kids a copy of it too because what happens if you have a medical crisis down here and your kids are how are your how are your kids gonna how are they supposed to help you at all right if they don't know where anything is at <laughs> if they don't know what you have in place they don't know where to find it you know some people will say well i i've told my kids that if anything happens to me it's the green notebook in the in the desk drawer but is that really how you want your kids to have to handle a crisis when they're freaking out? No. So let's get prepared and let's get your accounts, your passwords, your PIN numbers, your, your home security alarm password. Make sure your kids have all of that. So the binder is 11 tabs and it has a checklist of each, it has a checklist of suggested items to include behind each section. So if you have legal and you have properties in other states, you have a storage unit, make sure your kids know about this stuff and where to go if something does happen to you. I love the binder because it's a growing, it's a growing product. So like storage units ended up in the grab and go binder because I had a family that had storage units and they didn't even know that their parents had a storage unit until their parents um, were in a medical crisis. Dad had a stroke and mom's dementia progressed, so they couldn't get any information from mom. But they were going through the desk and the mail, and they found on the credit card that there's a monthly storage fee. And they're like, where's this? So then what do the kids have to do? They have to investigate and find out where's the key, what's the code to get in. I mean, all this little stuff is a big deal because the kids are freaking out. This isn't where they want to be spending their time and energy, and they don't want to be missing work just because things weren't already in place for them. So storage units ended up in the binder because I had an art collector on caseload and um, they know, the kids didn't know that she had a storage unit and inside that storage unit was literally hundreds of thousands of dollars of art and antiques. Can you imagine how sick you would be if that was your stuff in that storage unit and the kids just let it go because they thought it was like junk in there? <laughs> so I mean that one thing alone is, is such a big deal. So I, I just can't stress enough, life happens and you have to be prepared for it and you have to prepare your families for it. Close your eyes. You woke up not feeling yourself today. This is a little case study. So you woke up not feeling yourself today. You brush it off because you are the caregiver to your spouse who has dementia and you don't have time to be sick. You're still feeling weird 
your symptoms are getting worse, you call 911 and then you collapse. You had a stroke. You, your demented spouse is now left alone and he is not safe alone by himself. The hospital calls your daughter who lives out of state. You have another daughter too, but she is estranged from the family. Your other daughter is the primary caregiver of her husband who has terminal cancer and she can't leave him to come to your rescue. So think about that because you know what? This happens to millions of people every day. Just like when I told you I didn't wake up May 3rd, 2012, thinking, huh, I think I'm gonna get hit by a school bus and be like totally devastated for almost a year. The people that had strokes last week didn't wake up thinking I'm gonna have a stroke this, this morning and have my life totally devastated. So think about if this happened to you, Think about your considerations is how did you set yourself and your family up for success if you find yourself in a medical crisis? What conversations have you had as a family about the what ifs? How confident are you? Yeah, because usually when I see people grabbing pens to take notes. <laughs> and you, you can have a copy. Did you, can you email this to everybody too? Okay, so what conversations have you had with your family about the what ifs? of life, not even just of aging, but the what ifs. Do your children know what you have in place? Do they know if you have the healthcare power of attorney? Have you ever told them that it's them? Do you know how many times I have adult kids say, I guess I'm the healthcare power of attorney. I don't even know what their wishes are. They never told me. The kids are finding out about this stuff at the point of crisis and they're not happy about it. So do your children know what you have in place for your healthcare directives, your financial directives? How can you expect your adult kids to step in and pay your bills if they don't even know your accounts, your passwords, where your banks are? Just even in Estero and Vanita, I was, because I'm in networking groups, and I've had so many bankers tell me, Every single day we have 20, well, before the pandemic, we have 20 or 30 adult children literally bringing in envelopes that have the bank's name on it and say, it are my parents' customers of yours because dad had a stroke or mom can't talk anymore. So this is the problem. The adult children do not know what's going on. They don't know what's in place. So do your children know what you have in order for healthcare directives, financial directives, long-term care insurance? The first presentation I did this morning on Zoom was with the, with the, was with the insurance industry and I said, shame on you <laughs> for selling policies 20 years ago and then never having any other kind of relationship or information sharing with those clients because guess what? Those folks that bought those policies 20 years ago are now my clients. And when they're in the crisis, they literally have no idea what that policy covers. Yesterday, I was on a conference call with an insurance company and my client's son, because he has no idea. He's got Ohio teachers insurance and he has no idea what this is going to cover because his dad just had a stroke. He has no idea what it's going to cover. So. How prepared have you been for yourself, but also your adult children? Do you have your funeral arrangements? Kids have no idea what your wishes are. I've had children that buried their parents because they never had any conversation about it. But then as they're cleaning out the house, they find the family Bible where they're like, if I die, or like people always say, if I die, we're all gonna die. But when I die, I wanna be, you know, I wanna be cremated. Well, they buried her. She don't wanna be buried, but. If you don't talk about it, the kids aren't going to know. And I can tell you those kids were not happy because they feel guilty that they didn't follow through with what their loved one wanted. Accounts and passwords. Again, if you want, if you need to have your kids step in or your spouse step in, they need to have the tools that they need to be successful. If you do all of your online banking, they should have those accounts and passwords with whoever it is of your kids that you trust. Now, if you have a child that has a drug addict, if they're a drug addict or a gambler, you're probably not going to say, hey, Sally, here's, here's my Wells Fargo account information. So, because they'll be like, hey, this is cool. <laughs> so, be careful about who you give your information to, but that's, again, the importance of that family meeting. How open and forthright have you been with the kids if you are the caregiver and the true needs and demands of your spouse's needs? 
So if your loved one, if you're the caregiver and your loved one has a stroke, or like in our case study, you're the caregiver, your spouse has dementia, how forthright, how open have you been with your kids so that they know really what you're dealing with at home? We'll talk about that more in a little bit. Have you discussed if you need care, who is gonna provide your care? How will the care be paid? And where will you live if staying at home is no longer an option? This is the aging plan right here. What do you already have in place for legal decision-making, financial decision-making, insurance, your accounts, your passwords, everything that goes in the grab and go binder, but the real life stuff of if you should need care, who is gonna provide it? Are you expecting your kids to provide the care? I don't know, maybe you are, but we already know from the other insurance study that 58% of adult kids find themselves thrust into the role of caregiving without ever having any conversation about it. Do you think that everybody is wired to be a caregiver? Do you think? No, everybody is not wired to be a caregiver. It takes a special type of person to become a caregiver. And you have to have a special relationship to be a caregiver to an aging loved one. If the relationship isn't great with your kids and now they're caregiving for you, it's gonna be very uncomfortable and awkward for all of you. Um, where will, how will the care be paid? So how did you plan for worst case scenario? Do you have long-term care insurance? Do you have a life insurance hybrid policy that you can use as a long-term care policy if you need to? Do you have a reverse mortgage on your house if you need to pay for care? So how did you set yourself up and your family for success for when that medical crisis will happen? And what's the plan on where you're going to live if you can't stay at home? When I ask my senior clients, the moms and the dads, what are your goals as you age? What two responses do you think I get every single time? Stay want to stay at home. Absolutely. I want to stay at home. What else? I see. <laughs> I don't want to be a burden. I don't want to be a burden to my children, but guess what? Who do you think is calling me to, to help? The child. It's the adult children, because guess what? Now you become a burden on them <laughs> because you don't have a plan in place. Three years ago, I asked all of my adult children, and it's usually daughters, not always, but it's usually daughters, how much were you spending in out-of-pocket expense to come to the rescue every time your loved one has a medical crisis? How much do you think these daughters were spending on average out of out of pocket a year? Fifteen thousand. Why? Because if mom has Parkinson's and dad has dementia and Parkinson's people fall, that's just the nature of the disease. Parkinson's people fall. If mom falls, she hits her head and dad needs help because he has dementia and he can't stay home alone. Guess who's going to come to the rescue? And when you get those crisis calls. Airfare is not $25, right? And not everybody has a family relationship where they want, where your kids don't want to stay with you. Maybe you don't get along, you know, and they don't want to stay with you. So then they have to stay at a hotel. Or maybe you don't, you know, you guys all live at home yet, but some families, they already live in assisted living and there's not like a hotel room as part of the, part of the room and board fee, right? So they have to pay for a hotel. Or maybe they don't want to drive your car or you don't have a car anymore so they have to pay a rental so that fifteen thousand was just travel that's not missed work opportunities like the gen work study where 46 percent of adult children are missing out on work opportunities that's not the spouse who is saying look sally the first couple times your mom fell and you had to fly down i totally understood that but now you're really cutting into our finances and our family life so these daughters are not, they're, they're pulled in too many different directions. And it's, a lot of it is because there's not a plan in place on what's going to be the crisis plan instead of always having to fly down or fly across the country to go come to the rescue when there's a crisis. Most of my daughters, when they come to me, they've already exhausted their FMLA benefits. So they're, they're paid family leave. And employers are not how they used to be. <laughs> so employers, if they don't, if they, if these adult children who are still employed, 
they don't get their act together and they're not producing <laughs> results for the company, they're not going to be able to stay employed or they're not going to get those job promotions. Or if your daughter is a realtor, she can't really sell if she's not there to be able to sell, right? So if she's here, she can't make money potentially because she's a realtor, for example. So where will you live if staying at home is not an option? How many of you have no intention and no desire to go back up north when you get old? Everybody's hand should be up because why did you move down here? Because <laughs> you don't want to be in the cold. <laughs> but guess what? As you get older and frail and you have more care issues and more health issues, your kids, it's not feasible unless they are billionaires. It's just not feasible for them to always hop on a plane, miss two or three weeks of work to come down, save you, figure out what your options are, and then fly back up north just to get that next phone call that you fell again or you have another urinary tract infection, okay? Um, let's see. So how many people do you think, how many seniors do you think actually end up moving back up north? A lot. A lot. A lot. At least. At least. Because your kids can't keep flying down. It's just, it's not feasible. And a lot of seniors will say, well, I don't want to go back up north. It's too cold. But honestly, if if you're in that bad of health, you're not going to be out and about anyway. You're going to be in the facility. So part of what we do with Care Right is we facilitate the family meeting. We, we talk about all the good, the bad, and the ugly. We explore what the relationships are like and where do we need to add or outsource if there's family relationship issues or if you don't have money to pay for care, how is that care going to get paid? And you have to be thinking about these things now because in the midst of it, you're not going to seek out a Medicaid attorney at midnight and think that they're going to answer their phone, right? So we have to be putting this stuff together now. Part of what we do is, like I said, not only facilitate the family meeting, that's the big part because that's how we develop the aging plan is find out what are your goals as you age? How are you going to pay for the care when the time comes that you need it? Because unfortunately, most seniors can't make it through their aging years without needing care, right? I needed care at 40. <laughs> so it's just part of life. And so how are you going to pay for that? Home care ranges about $25 to $28 an hour all across the country. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> this is why I can't talk to my parents. <laughs> $25 to $28 an hour. Because of our applicant pool that we have to choose from, um which means that it's slim pickings out there because again not everybody is meant to be a caregiver not everybody wants to earn 11 or 12 dollars because that's how much they actually get paid the home care companies charge you 25 to 28 but the caregiver is actually only paid about 50 percent of that so usually it's a 50 percent markup because we have overhead and you know taxes and employment stuff that we have to pay for employees so if you think about if you need round the clock care, live in care or 24 hour care, I have clients that are paying 10 grand out of pocket just so they can stay at home. What do you think their complaints are about having caregivers in their home all of the time? No privacy, theft, abuse. abuse. What? I don't, like I don't like them. What about down here specifically? They don't speak English. Massive, massive communication barriers. Every single client I have down here chose to stay at home and I have this conversation with them during the family meeting. That's great, Ethel, if you want to stay at home, but know that you're going to have, if you need 24 hour care, seven days a week, they staff 12 hour shifts. So at least twice a day, you're going to have a changeover in people coming into your home. And that's provided the, care that the caregiver doesn't call in sick or is a no-show. Because if they're a no-show, then guess what the home care company has to do? They have to piece that shift together with whoever's available. So to fill a 12-hour shift, they might have people that are only available for, why well, can help out for these two hours? Why well, can help out for these two? So you might end up with six people to fill a 12 hour shift, right? People don't like that. Or they might not be able to fill it at all. 
and you're stuck by yourself for a 12 hour shift. And if you need round the clock care, you probably can't take care of yourself for 12 hours because you'll have to go to the bathroom or you'll have to eat or you'll need your medication or you need a shower or you have a doctor's appointment, right? So those are the, those are the complaints I have or the complaints that my clients give me is the caregivers usually don't speak English. They don't have critical thinking skills. So about six, this is weird, but I'm going to say it anyway, because it's real life. And that's why I'm here is to tell you real life stuff at least six times a month. Now think about it. I have clients in 28 different states because I'm virtual. I, I have everybody jump on a Zoom call and we talk about the good and the bad and the ugly of aging and put that aging plan in place. Because guess what? Kids don't live down the street. So the only way to have a family meeting is to use Zoom or Skype. But at least six to seven times a month, I get clients calling because their toilet overflowed and the caregiver don't know to like shut the water valve off. So there's just no critical, there's just a lack of critical thinking skills. Or I have clients that still like their things ironed. Who do you think is ironing? People don't iron anymore. These caregivers, if you need help with food, they don't cook, they don't know how to cook. A lot of them are millennials. They don't know how to clean, they don't know how to cook. And they're on their cell phones all the time. So I've got people paying 10 grand and that's just one caregiver for mom. If you've got two aging parents or you and your spouse need care and round the clock care, you don't get to share the caregiver, you get your own caregiver. So that's 20 grand out of pocket, unless you have long-term care. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what they're paying because they wanted to age in place at home and not be a burden on their kid. <laughs> So they're paying 20 grand because like my dad is 6'4". When he had his stroke, thankfully, he didn't have any lingering damage from it. But there's no way that these little caregivers who are from wherever it is that they're from, there's no way that one caregiver could tend to my dad. He's too tall. So they would have to send out two caregivers just for my dad. My mom has dementia. She, she needs one-on-one -on -one attention. So that I would have to pay or they would have to pay three caregivers if they were to stay at home. It's just not feasible. Even the best long-term care insurance policy isn't going to cover 100%. It's just not. So these are just things to think about. So who, are, who is gonna provide your care? <laughs> are you expecting your kids to fly down every time there's an issue? Or are you expecting your kids to take early retirement? Because guess what, that's what they do. The kids are leaving the workforce in droves because they have to be a caregiver and they don't know that there's other solutions available to them. Where are you gonna live? Part of what we do in that aging plan is we explore during the family meeting, okay, if you can't stay at home because your health is, is poor or you have Parkinson's or dementia progresses and you're not safe at home anymore, where does it make sense for you to hang your hat? So we do what we call a community matrix we, my team and I do all of the market research for, for assisted living centers or skilled nursing or memory care facilities in the areas where the kids are so that we can make informed decisions and say, okay, here's what they have for a waiting list. Because a lot of good places have waiting lists of two, three, four, five years. Now, not so much during the pandemic because everybody yanked their parents out because <laughs> they, they didn't want their parents to get COVID during the pandemic. They wanted to be able to see them. So, so far, I mean, we do about 25 community matrix projects a week for families across the country. So far since COVID, they all have openings. There's no waiting list because people are staying home because they don't want to not ever see their family again or risk getting COVID because once COVID gets in these buildings, you've seen the news, it's downhill from there. So COVID is not over yet, and it's, it's definitely giving people a lot more to think about during their aging plan about, hey, if mom gets COVID, where is she going to live? Facilities aren't taking COVID patients. So I've got clients that are three hours away because that's the nearest rehab center that's accepting COVID patients. If you and your spouse need two different levels of care, where are you going to live? So that you don't end up in facility A and your husband ends up in facility B. The only way to try to avoid that is to put a plan together. That's why we do those community matrixes. We find out what their care levels are. How sick can you be and still stay in that particular level of care? How much money do you need to be able to get in there? 
We've got Maureen Park, you've heard of that. You have to have four to five million and Bentley Village, same thing, four to five million to get in there. So just because there's communities around here doesn't mean you financially qualify. So you have to financially qualify, physically qualify and cognitively qualify. And because people want to age in place at home, what do you think happens? They age in place at home and then they get so sick and so frail and, and so medically complex that they totally bypassed assisted living level of care. And now they only qualify for nursing home level of care. What do you think the environment is? How different do you think the environment is in assisted living compared to a nursing home? Horrible. It's totally different, right? Assisted living, you have your own apartment, you have privacy, you have a call light, you have three meals a day if you want them, you have activities to go to. In a skilled nursing center, a nursing home, that's going to run you about 10 to 12 grand a month. Um, and you're potentially going to have a roommate. So you're going to have enough room for a twin bed, your bedside table, and a chair. But if you're in a wheelchair, then they have to pull the other chair out because there's not enough room for both. Okay? And God forbid you need a Hoyer lift. <laughs> then there's that, that it's just that much tighter. So where are you going to live when the home's not an option? How many people think about moving in? Well, I'll just move in with my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So that rarely works. It really rarely, rarely works. Why? Because both parties don't have enough privacy. How do you think that if you're, if you, say your daughter, because a lot of these daughters are in the sandwich generation, right? So they have little kids and they still have, they still have aging parents. Do you think that it works out well? It's kind of cute when little Michael runs into your room the first three or four times because you just moved in and it's all fun and exciting. But when you're in the bathroom or shower and little Michael runs into your room because he doesn't know to knock yet, it's not great. So privacy on both ends. Spousal privacy. Privacy in general. <laughs> you know, if you have dementia and when that progresses, they often get their days and nights mixed up. So how great is that if your demented spouse walks in on your daughter and son-in-law at three o'clock in the morning because he has his days and nights mixed up? How great do you think it is when your daughter's house starts looking and smelling like a nursing home because now there's wheelchairs, there's lifts, there's urinals, there's commodes and those kind of things. Cause that's what really, that's what is really happening out there, okay? Um, so it just, it really works unless you actually have conversation about it and say, look, I, you can stay here, but as long as this and this and this, where you're not affecting my marriage, you're not affecting my children's life, you're not affecting our finances, and you're not affecting my job opportunities, you can stay here. So if it happens, you just need to make sure you have an exit strategy or you all have to have an exit strategy. Otherwise, then the daughters, because again, it's the daughters that call me. Well, mom's been living with me for eight months and it started out fine, but then she keeps falling and now she's incontinent. And now I have to miss work to take her to doctor's appointments and it just doesn't work out anymore. So again, we talked about what is your plan if you require one level of care and your spouse requires another level of care? Most spouses, not everybody, but most spouses don't want to be apart as they age. Some do. <laughs> <laughs> Some should have been apart for a lot longer, <laughs> but most of them do not want to be apart as they age. But guess what? When you both need a different level of care, or say you need the same level of care, what's the likelihood that a, a community is going to have an opening for both of you? Especially if mom needs memory care and dad needs assisted living, the timing has to be right. Otherwise, you're going to end up lopsided, so to speak, right? Mom might be able to get placed, but what are we going to do with dad until we wait for an open bed? How are we going to supplement that care? So total chaos, anxiety, fear, and overwhelm. Aren't you guys glad you came today? <laughs> this is so uplifting. <laughs> but this is real life stuff. Literally, I work 12 hour days with families all across the country. This is real life stuff. This is what this is what's going on out there. Your daughter spends a thousand dollars on emergency airfare. Her husband is not thrilled with the expense and her being gone for an uncertain amount of time. And I should have put again in parentheses. Your daughter has three major projects that she's working on for work. All are due by the end of the month. If she impresses her boss, 
She's up for a major promotion, which is her dream job. She arrives to the hospital. The doctor tells her the stroke damage is major and you'll need extensive rehab. And even if you do rehab well, you'll still need round the clock care and supervision. The stroke caused significant mental confusion. You are unable to tell her where your health care and financial directives are. She is going to have to step in and pay your bills, but she has no idea what accounts and passwords you have. This is an every single day scenario. I don't think it's rare, it's ever, literally every single day. The turmoil continues. So she stays at your home <laughs> and suddenly realizes how confused her dad is. He is up all night wandering around the house and he's going into her bedroom. She didn't realize he needed reminded or cued to take his medication until she was there for four days because she's been busy with you at the hospital, right? And then she saw the untouched pill container and realized, oh my gosh, dad's not able to take his meds on his own. She didn't realize he needed reminders to shower. She was there a whole week before it occurred to her that dad never showered. She sees your calendar and realizes her dad missed his neurology appointment this week and it takes months to get into these specialty positions. Have you ever experienced that? You need to get in and they're booked for weeks or months at a time. Your health is touch and go for three weeks. She realizes she can't leave Florida until you are better situated. She hasn't had time to start her work projects and her career clock is ticking. You don't know this, but she is having marital problems. Her husband is getting impatient and wants to know when she will be back to tend to their own family. Is this setting the stage of a pretty typical scenario? Could you see maybe your own family in this or people you know? Or you? Next, you finally get discharged from the hospital. Your mind is a little bit more clear. You are at least oriented to what is happening. You are scared and you're wondering if this is your new physical baseline. Are you ever gonna be able to play tennis again or walk again or play golf? You are scared for your spouse. How is he doing? Who is taking care of him? Is he safe? That's one of the biggest concerns that fam the spouses who are caregivers, when I ask them, what's your plan if you have a medical crisis and you're the caregiver for your spouse with dementia or who had a stroke and they're dependent on you, that's what keeps these spousal caregivers up at night. So they don't have a plan, so we need to fix that. The doctor says you will need continuous care. You thought Medicare will pay for every expense as you age, only to find out that once you graduated from a rehab center, you have to pay out of pocket the cost of ongoing care unless you have long-term care insurance or veteran benefits, VA benefits. Your options are to return home with live-in care about 10 grand a month or live in a skilled nursing center, a nursing home for about 10 to 12 grand a month. Your husband can't live alone, so memory care is about five to eight grand a month. Your daughter was already feeling stressed and overwhelmed within the first two days of being in Florida. And she's been here for three weeks now trying to sort out what your options are. So you decide to try living at home with home care because your goal is to age in place at home. <laughs> As stated earlier, 48% of seniors do not follow through with hospital discharge instructions because you're too sick and you're probably a caregiver. After a major stroke, you will have multiple follow-up appointments, and I can vouch for that. You can no longer drive. Your husband can't be alone, so you'll need to hire a caregiver for him. You are still recovering and do not have energy, and you can't drive. Hence, again, why 48% of seniors can't make it to their appointments. Your daughter had to return home. She missed her work deadlines, and her husband is giving her the cold shoulder. You don't like the traffic coming into your home because now you have home care and you have physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, and a nurse all coming into your home every single day on top of the companions. You don't like the traffic. Okay, we got that established. Most of the caregivers do not speak English and they spend most of their shift on their cell phones. What is your plan? So let's talk about that for a couple of minutes. 
what would you do? If this happened to you, if any of you are family caregivers or a spousal caregiver, really, what would you do if, if you're the one that had the medical crisis or your spouse had the medical crisis and you don't know what's in place, insurance wise or finances, really, what would you do and how, how do you think your family would fare? How do you think your adult children would fare if they had to step in and figure things out for you? It's a mess. It's a mess. After hearing some of this so far, how many of you can 100% confidently say that you think you have things in place and your kids are prepared and they have all the documents that they would need and you've had all the conversations about these types of situations? the documentation and all of that, but not the next step. I mean, all the information is there, they've each got their own binders, they don't want to hear us, but the next step, other than die, how about the death sorted out? Right. Have in between. The in between, yeah. So, so some people have things in order. It's always good to just have a, another set of eyes looking to say, okay, that's great. It's some people think that because they have a financial planner, their long-term care insurance, and, the, and their estate documents, that that's it. But do you really know, like, do your kids know what's your hospital preference? And do they know, like, which home care company that they would call if they needed to activate that? And where would you live if you had a major stroke? And would they be, would you be staying down here? Would you go back up north? So the aging plan is all of those pieces and more. Um, and that's why it's critical that we have those conversations with the family now while things are going well, instead of that, that 11th hour when we're all scrambling and no one's thinking clearly. So when I talk about an aging plan, this is what's in there. Now you can understand the importance of an aging plan, having a neutral third party person facilitate the family meeting and go through what is, what's, what is your plan and kind of play devil's advocate. Because again, people want to age in place at home. That's good. Just so you know, this is what it's like when you age in place at home. And if you wait too long, you're not gonna you're not gonna make it into assisted living. You're gonna end up in a nursing home. And your children may not be willing to take take on this responsibility. And your children may not be willing or interested or able mm -hmm. to take on this type of responsibility. And why would you want to put your children through that? But guess what? Literally, hundreds of families choose to put their kids through that. And Hopefully now that you've heard really what's happening and, and the impact this has, what do you think about this poor daughter? But even if you have a plan in place, the options don't seem that great, you know, because you've got a risk somewhere, either in a nursing home or by yourself or with a kiddo, unless there's a fourth option that you're going to come up with. Well, and that's why it's important to talk about those things. Okay, because but you're also saying that none, none of them are really good. So well, my neighbor across the street who's not there anymore. I met his daughter while she was moving the boxes out of the house because her father fell and her mother had uh, was hospitalized. And it was the many times the parent, I didn't know this, but they were coming, the two daughters were coming back and forth. Yep. And they finally moved to Massey to an assisted living in Pennsylvania. Yeah. I have another scenario uh, in English. Uh, that parent had to the seven years old. And then we have two in two different hospitals by transatlantic. We yep. need a wonderful, wonderful people, and there's no resentment here. But then you have one in one hospital, one in another hospital, yep. and then you have one who's ready to go to assisted living, and somebody else who says, No, I promised I would look after you for life, and I'm going. Yep. And you're flying three and a half thousand miles and trying to get the two to agree. Yep. So, so once you can have all these plans in place, you you know um, what you're going to do and everything else. I think it's also that last minute where I don't want to go. Right. Um, even though you have a plan. Right. Um, right. Can you just repeat that? I'm gonna try to condense that a little bit. <laughs> so so if you have two sets of aging parents in two totally separate areas or overseas. 
what is your plan? How is that going to work if you've got one set or one one aging loved one that is not doing well and, and is going to be passing, and maybe the other one needs to go to an assisted living? How are you supposed to juggle all of that? And how what kind of planning can you put in place for that? So that's sort of a recap of what you what you shared. We also we also haven't even talked about blended families. Like if you have only been married for a few years, and I mean, what kind of how how have you prepared, you know, that that family, all of your family members, your stepkids and so forth in this in this type of scenario? Oftentimes um, with blended families, this is when there's that crisis. This is sometimes the first time that these adult children have actually talked. Like they just don't have, a, you know, maybe dad and mom are 80 and 75 and the kids just never they didn't have a relationship with each other. And now that dad's got dementia. They're like, well, I don't want my mom's health failing, taking care of your dad. You know, there's no emotional tie there with the kids because of the second marriage, perhaps. So there's a lot of complexities, whether it's out of country, out of state, blended families, dysfunctional families, um, or adult children. Sometimes the parents are in better shape, physically shape, than their adult parents are, right? So um, community matrix. Uh, that's what we talked about, the market research in multiple states and areas so you can make informed decisions. Because um, it's a lot more expensive in New York than it is down here. It's a lot more expensive in Connecticut, Maryland, and Rhode Island. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy expensive up there. I've got clients in those in those states, they're paying 14 to 16 grand just in the nursing home. And that's just one one parent. So, um, so where will you live if you can't stay at home? Are you expecting your kids to come to the rescue every time there's a crisis? And who will advocate for you if your kids live far away? Like I told you with my mom at the hospital, she has dementia. If my dad or I weren't there literally every waking moment, she was in so much pain and they weren't addressing her pain, who's going to advocate for you? The grab and go binder, that's, that's a, like I said, the organizational tool to get your stuff organized. It's got checklists, it's got autofill PDFs, so that if you change any information, like your attorney, you, you move, or you change doctors, you just update that form and you can re-email it out to your kids. So there's my contact information. So we talked about a lot of stuff. And it's not uplifting stuff, you're right, but it's stuff that happens to families every single day. What were your thoughts about that case study? Which one? <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so the stroke and then this poor daughter. It's real. It's it is and, real. And, and it is, it's, it's very distressing, but it is, it is real. And so I, <laughs> I think it'd be the thing, the key, the biggest key that I'm hearing is when the children, because really, we're we're talking about where are we going, but we have to have our children speaking to one another. Right. So that I mean, the book is great, except it's useless if the communication of the siblings is poor or non-existent. Right. Or unwilling. Right. Well. The book is never useless because that's a good starting tool, but the reality is that if, and this is like every family, every family has their own family culture, right? It's like how you do things in your family. Like our family culture, we grew up very communicative. You know, my dad or my mom, if there were big family things that we needed to talk about, we had a Kruger family meeting and we all gathered around the kitchen table and talked. You know, my dad, was up for this major dream job promotion that he could have taken, but it would have required a move out of state, like way out of state. And none of us wanted to do that, but we had a family meeting. So I'm just accustomed, like our family culture is we talk about stuff. When there's questions, conflict, different things that come up, we actually talk it through. Not every family does that. And that's again why 85% of my clients come to me and I'm doing family mediation. Families need to have a neutral third party person facilitate a family meeting. Because even if you took the best of notes and you memorized the PowerPoint, do you really feel confident that you could sit your kids down on Zoom or 
at Easter or whatever and say, okay, kids, we're going to talk about food stuff here. I can tell you that most kids would be so elated if you brought this up because as a daughter myself, <laughs> um, if my parents didn't have that open communication and if I didn't do what I do for a living, I can't imagine how awful it would have been when mom's dementia progressed because of her fall and dad had the stroke. If my siblings and I didn't get along, do you know how awful that would be? Like it's awful in general, but how awful to feel like you're totally alone in this. And, and if you have open dialogue and you set the tone with your kids and say, look, we've got to have a family meeting and we're going to talk about some stuff that might not be very comfortable, but I can tell you it's a lot more uncomfortable if you're doing this at the hospital bedside at two o'clock in the morning and you have your daughter on Skype because <laughs> that's where you have to tell her where stuff is at. Does that make sense? So what do you think is the best route to go? Kind of absorbing all of this information. It's a lot to take in, right? <laughs> but it's hopefully, because a lot of people just assume they want to kind of lean towards the negative, like, oh, this is awful, this is stressful, this is not something I want to deal with or talk about or, or talk with my kids about. But I ask you all to think about it in a different way, like how energizing this can be for your family and for you to have that proactive plan in place so that your daughter or your son isn't missing job opportunities or having marital problems or spending $15,000 out of pocket because that's that's what is happening out there and most people don't want to put their family through that and the assumption is they can pay for the yeah. <laughs> yeah and these families they're maxing out their credit cards like they'll say well we have a credit card just for mom and dad and so but they can't pay it off every month because there's always a crisis <laughs> so think about like what position do you want to put your kids in Any questions or any other thoughts? Who's going to go home and be like a group text to the kids? Hey kids, I just went to this workshop. We have some stuff to do. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you a story just yesterday. So my my brother-in-law is in the hospital in one place. Yep. Okay. His wife can't drive and she's home. But my other sister-in-law is in the hospital in Texas. Yep. Neither situation has children who have come forward right to handle what's going to happen when those two people go home yep and um uh the one the one family the two two adult boys are in new york and they can't get here because of covid yep or, and like or chicago with, airlines are shut down because of the snowstorm like right now nobody's Travel. <laughs> yeah. So, it's, it's, um, so um, I'm curious about the variety of services that you provide. Uh, you know, um, you do the, um, the mediation and so forth. But 20 years ago, um, my parents died 20 years ago within just a few weeks of each other. Sure. And one of them was ill with cancer and numerous surgeries for uh, a couple of years. And then my mother had a heart attack and then she passed away and so forth. So it was a very um, it was a very challenging time. And we were fortunate for a couple of reasons. One is that they were cognizant and capable mentally right to the very end, sure. both of it, regardless of what they went through. And the other was that my brother, sister, and I really worked together as a team, mm -hmm. even when it wasn't all that easy with decision making with my parents. But one of the things that you talked about is the hospital or medical advocacy. Yeah. And I was the medical advocate for, for both of them, really, but more for my dad. Yeah. And without that, the medications, the number of doctors involved, so many different things. I mean, it was just an eye opener for me. And I was lucky in my the work that I had at that time, I was able to be there as necessary. So do you provide medical advocacy? Mm -hmm. How do you do it? What do you do? What's that piece of it, which I think is really important. Yeah. So I actually have um, at least eight different service offerings. So the usually people engage in the aging plan because they've been to a workshop like this and they're like, wow, we need help with this. 
Um, so aging planning, um, the advocacy piece is for families. I have two kind of two options for families. If they live here, I can be the patient advocate and go with them to their appointments or if they're in the hospital, go there, talk to the physicians, keep the family updated and keep the family like calm because <laughs> they're scared, right? And, and the patients are scared. But I'm also, I'm also creating um, do-it-yourself kits. So how to facilitate your own family meeting. Here's the agenda, here's some scripts. How to be your own patient advocate or an advocate for someone else. There's 25 different things on that checklist. You'll see if you have that other handout. I like bullet points. <laughs> so I know that the handout, the eight and a half by 11. Yeah, that. Oh, that's the one you got. I have, yeah. Yeah, so you have that. Those are just considerations about how prepared are you. But I'm creating do-it-yourself kits. So if you want to have your own family meeting, how to do that and, and what conversations and how to have those conversations. If you need to be your own patient advocate, just one simple thing. When my mom, I don't know how this happens, but it happens to clients all the time and it happens to my mom. They go into the ER, but by the time they get admitted and they go upstairs because they have a bed open now, <laughs> right? Medications drop off the medication list. So my mom's on Coumadin and she's also, when you're on, when you're on certain medications and you have like Lasix because she's got fluid, then you have to have potassium too, right? Well, anyway, you have to have potassium too. And so I don't know how this happens, but it dropped off, the potassium dropped off on her medication list by the time she got out of the hospital. And because when you leave the hospital and you have your qualifying Medicare stage and you go into rehab, um, then they have a whole other set of doctors and nurses that look at stuff. Well, no one knew that she was supposed to be on potassium. Like, it, it never occurred to somebody like, oh, she's on Coumadin, but she's not taking the potassium. So I get a call, of course, at two o'clock in the morning because she fell. I meet her at the ER and her potassium is like zero because no one caught that. So like, I just continually add to this advocacy checklist. Like you have to, you have to become like a little pharmacist. Like, okay, why did this medication change? Why is this one added? Like there's, so there's like over 25 different pieces to being an advocate. Not only just the medication piece, that's a big piece, but just care. Like how soon are they answering the call like? I can do virtual advocacy as well. So I'll get my client on, because we have a scheduled call. So I'll get my client on the call and be like, turn on your call light. And then we stay on the phone and it'll take maybe 20 minutes. It might take an hour and a half, but I time it because then I can address that with the charge nurse or the administrator. And so I just work my way up to whomever it is I need to talk to that can be a decision maker and make care better. So patient advocacy is a key part aging planning, family mediation. Some people hire me just to facilitate the family meeting and not really do the aging plan, but just have a conversation because the kids, you know, there's, not everybody works as a team. Um, some people bring me in just to do patient advocacy. So it just, it just really depends on what their needs are. I do a 30 minute consult just to kind of get an overview and see what the needs are and then we can go from there. But um, those, are, those are big pieces. You can't do all this. Oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> How many people are in your company? Yeah, so I have I have 13 employees, but everybody starts with me because, well, honestly, because people come to me in crisis and families aren't getting along and I'm not seeing them at their best. Um, and because it's pretty much 24-7, they all start with me and then I can kind of farm them out depending on what their situation is. Pam mentioned something to me because you were asking who's going to step in and you got to come. I said neighbors. We're fortunate to live in a community where yes. we all will take you to your um, cancer treatment and sure. make your meal. That's the big key of where we are in the sandwich. Which is great for, so what you're saying is that who's going to take care of you if your daughter can't step in. But you also can't rely on neighbors because that will hurt your relationship sure. in time. And that's fine to take, you know, Lucy over to the doctor. But if you have a loved one with dementia and they're wandering or they're sundowning in the afternoon, you can't expect someone who's not trained in dementia to be able to bring them back home. Like Sunday night, for example, 
I got a call. This is a family I've had three consults with already. Three is my max. Like if it if you if it hasn't occurred to you that putting a plan together after a, a third call, it, you're probably just not gonna it just don't resonate with you to put a plan together. But anyway, she called me Sunday night. She was she's the wife. She was exhausted. Her husband has mid to late stage dementia, which means he's wandering, he's getting aggressive, he's getting paranoid, um, and he's sundowning in the afternoon. She's ex and he's got his days and nights mixed up, so she's not getting any sleep whatsoever. So she lays down just to like rest her eyes, and she just wants to take like a five minute rest. She fell asleep for hours. So I get the call at 8:30 at night on Sunday. She's panicked because she fell asleep at like five <laughs> she woke up and he's gone so i was like you have to call the police and, and went through the whole thing you have to submit a picture of them so they know what to look, look for and stuff so we finally finally get him found he was he walked six miles from their house he walked to bonita to their where they used to live 15 years ago except where his memory is better so he walked to their old house, was banging on the door because he wanted in because he thought that was his house. So now she's decided that you're right, it, it makes sense to put a plan together because she got scared enough and she was uncomfortable enough. But yeah, so dementia patients or if your spouse has a stroke, you can't expect neighbors to come in and toilet and stuff like that. But that's cool that you have such a great community as far as that type of stuff, bringing meals, like a lot of communities are good that way they'll bring each other meals and stuff um and transportation but pretty much anything beyond that and it gets too it, it, it'll start affecting the relationship it's too personal, it's too personal yeah so i can even step in and sure that's mm -hmm. the one of our neighbors you really need help you can't do this by yourself yeah so for that. yeah yeah you know i just to mention one one other thing with my brother-in-law and sister-in-law about advocacy, she could not get anybody in the hospital to give her information right. about what was wrong with him. Right. So that was a big issue. So one thing, one thing about that is that um, one thing you should be doing for yourselves is make sure that your position, that you sign the HIPAA agreement, so that your doctors, if you end up in the hospital, God forbid, you end up in the hospital that they will be able to talk to your spouse or to your children, whoever it is that is your power of attorney, because otherwise they, they can't. They, they well, I'm not talking about that they couldn't be put, but she's on the list. She couldn't get anybody to answer. So that's another thing with COVID, these hospitals and these facilities, they have like almost zero communication because they're swamped, right? So that is the biggest complaint is from families all across the country. It's not just down here, but all of, well, obviously <laughs> they're in Texas. Um, that is the biggest complaint, and, and it's because these, these nurses are providing the care, so they can't be on the phone all day or they can't take care of the patient. So, and the nurse is who you need to talk to because the doctor's not going to necessarily call you. It's a mess. I mean, when I got my master's degree, I wrote in 2010, I wrote my thesis on the, the landscape of healthcare and how we are just woefully ill prepared for the volume of people, volume of patients. And the pandemic has proven that to be the case as well. Even with getting into these specialty clinics, that's why I threw that in there about the neurologist missing the appointment because the daughter didn't know <laughs> until it was after the fact. I, it's, it can be weeks to be able to get into these specialty clinics. So it's, it's really important, like just even with your, doc, with your own doctor's appointments, just, just in case something happens to you, make sure that your kids know, especially if you're the caregiver, Make sure and caregiving to a vulnerable adult. Make sure that your kids have an idea. If one solution my families do is they'll use like Google Drive or they'll have a family calendar so that you know that you just plug stuff in. Like dad has therapy next week, physical therapy, or he has this new medication, just to be able to keep in touch with the family. I have some families that will do a private family Facebook group. And that way they can communicate. So we use like a, we have our own family calendar because I am the caregiver for both of my parents. So that way they both have their calendar and my brother and sister can log in anytime and be like, oh, dad's got a urology appointment. But I also have a group text 
on here and let them know exactly what's going on because that's the other biggest complaint with with kids is they don't find out about what happened to you for weeks after the fact or the primary caregiver is so overwhelmed and bombarded they can't just like communicate all the time so then siblings get ticked off with each other because well how come you didn't tell me that dad had this neurology appointment what what happened there and that's where family dynamics can really start to crumble. Another question, what is your experience with hospitalists and uh, what is happening with them in this area and maybe more generally? So what is, so what's happening with hospitalists? Um, pretty much at this point because of, because of volume and because of the pandemic, it, it really is all hands on deck. Hospitalists are, um, they're just, they're qualified just as good as any other position that can come in. Um, but you also have to think about um, as far as for ongoing medical care, what, what types of positions do you need to have already on your plan of care? And what types of relationships do you have with them? Do you have, for example, even with the hospitalist, you can sign up on my chart. So that you can get better communication and that might be a solution for your family there as well if they're on my chart um but those those are also different solutions for communication they're just i'm not sure what your question is as far as like what well as a, kind of as a point of um contact um coordinating care yeah because so many different uh, specialties can be involved and they're not talking to they're each not other. communicating so as an advocate you would want to know that, but in the hospital, you also hope that there's someone who is admitting and doing discharge orders who also has the full scope yeah. of care. And that's the problem. That's actually one of the 15 reasons I built my company is because they're healthcare, shame on us, we work in silos. Right. I mean, I've had both parents in the hospital twice in the last two years. I've never once even with my own clients. I've never once had anybody call and be like, hey, just making sure you made it to your appointment. And shame on healthcare for being so disjointed and disconnected. That's why that's why I have such a heavy patient advocacy caseload is because there's no one doing it. There's no one coordinating care. There's no one really taking these families by the hand and saying, let me help you because you're not feeling well, you're still weak. And, and that's great if they get better and they don't need me anymore, but the reality is, in healthcare, I just I hate to say this because it's a slam on my own industry, but it's it's shameful. It's shameful. The quality of care. I have clients that their wives, just like all of you, cute little petite little ladies that were advocating for their husband. And I've had in hospitals here in Naples, I've had the her spouse, the wives, be escorted out of the hospital by security just for advocating for their spouse. It's pathetic. It's absolutely pathetic. And that's just not Naples. It just seems, it just seems like in healthcare, they they don't want the headache. <laughs> they don't want to be held accountable. And they don't want someone, that's why I get so much pushback with patient advocacy. As a patient advocate, I get so much pushback from facilities because you're like, well, of course we're going to take good care of our of your of your client. Well, no, not when it takes an hour and 25 minutes for you to answer the call light. Or Last week I had a wife, she called because her she knows that she put her husband in a certain type of undergarment, depends. And when he ended up going to the hospital because he fell out of bed again, um, he was in two depends and they were the they were actually the same depends. They just put a second depend on him in the facility. And he had that same depend on for four days because when she brought him to the facility, he had the one on. And when she went to see him at the hospital at the ER, he had two on and they were the same ones that she had put on him, the kind that she put on from home. And guess what? His whole area completely, completely infected, a fungal infection. He's got dementia and believe me, because she just came down from up north, so he's already, he's already confused from having dementia. But because of the move back down north, even though she was sure that he'd remember their condo down here, because they've been coming down for 20 years, but that's the thing is people don't understand dementia. And so he had a major condition change because he doesn't do well with change, and he's now in a memory care unit. And they're the ones that put they doubled the they doubled the pen of them, and now his groin is full of fungus. 
And because the pain is painful and uncomfortable, he's got more behaviors just from that. And now no facility is going to take him because he's got behaviors. <laughs> and he ended up testing positive for COVID. So oh this is so this is, but this is what I'm telling you. This is like this is what I deal with every single day. This is what's going on out there, and this is what happened. None of the people that called me last week thought any of this stuff was going to happen to them. Do you have a, a question for your grab and go bag? Is there some something that you have kind of need to follow, like you know, the template to know exactly what? Yeah, the grab and go binder. You can actually buy that on the internet. You can buy that on my um, website because it's it's got the whole checklist. Um, it's $150, but it's plug and play. So all you literally have to do is put everything in each tab, um, and then I I do an email in, um, I do an email three to four times a year, just a gentle reminder to update your binder. Like my sister just moved to a, a different home. And because she's on my life insurance as a beneficiary, I had to update three documents in my binder just because she moved, <laughs> right? Um, so I, I send out three to four email reminders every year. And then I also add content to it. So like right now I'm working on a pet section because what happens if you have, what happens if you have a pet and then a crisis happens, where's the dog gonna go? So yeah, so you can actually, you've got my um, Paul Rack card there. Yeah, it's also my website and stuff is also on the bottom. It's on my um, letterhead too. If you have the checklist, the aging plan checklist. Yep. Yeah. Did you happen to see the news? The latest demand left five million dollars. I heard that on the way over here. What? Five million dollars left to his dog. This yeah, this man died and he left five million to his dog. And I'm like. <laughs> well, you know what? It just depends. That's why I say these family dynamics are tricky. Which he said it's it's a hospitalist, it's doing what they're supposed to be doing, or exactly what you need caring for you in the hospital. Because if you think that your cardiologist is coming to visit you in the hospital while he's also taking care of patients in his office. We're mistaken. Yeah. And she, he, he told me that the people in medical school, that it's like uh, hospitalists or this learn that category, like a cardiologist, like an like a, a urologist, it's, own specialty. it's its own specialty. And that he thinks that we are ill informed here. Because we think that a hospital is, is just somebody who's, you know, like a second grade doctor at the hospital, which is not what they're, I'm just saying. Yes. They're trained, they graduate with a degree, and that's their specialty is hospitalist. I've never heard the term. Can you define what they are They were four days, or four, three days, and then another one comes down on a day. So I back to all of your documentation to them. When Hank was in the hospital, we had somebody every couple of days. He came in taking four medications and he left with like 20. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not, a good, that's not a good situation, right? That's a bad situation. So two years ago, Elaine, you probably, if you've been here for a while, you know what MCA went through. Right. And because they were trying to bring hospitalists in, but it became a political right. thing. If, so, I mean, I know, I mean, I know a little bit about it, um, Hank's situation is terrible. It's not what it's not yeah. training. Yeah. No, but they were trying to bring it in. Uh, anyway, it's another, well, the other doctors got mad because they took their patients. It was the patients because. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's a long story. Yeah. And you had a question or a comment? No. I think it was so amusing. And yeah, but it, my sister has a little bit. She is so in love with it. And, her health is not what it could be. So in her will, she has a couple that did a very large black lab, but a very sweet nature door. Yeah. It was a service door. Sure. So uh, she has left with a couple that are going to take care of the dog, sufficient funds sure. to buy yeah. the dog. Mm -hmm. So my brother did $50 for the dog. 
<laughs> you know, it's true though that because I have a lot of attorneys in my network. Because I not not only when I develop the aging plan, we're looking at where are the gaps in your plan. Like a lot of people don't have living will or the power of attorney, or they do, but it's 20 years ago, or it's in New York and they're here, like they're the Florida residents. So, or they named the person they named 20 years ago as their healthcare decision maker is either dead or demented, or you don't get along with them anymore. So. The value of the aging plan is not only the, the family meeting facilitated by a neutral person, but also let's pull the documents that you have and make sure you understand, are they updated? And if not, do you already have an existing attorney that you're working with or do you need a new referral? And that's what, that's the whole point is making sure that all the professionals that we need are on the team and making sure what do you have for insurance like i said i do probably 15 insurance calls a week and i don't i don't do insurance that's its own beast but i i get the insurance provider on the phone so that we can say okay what kind of coverage just like this gentleman i was telling you about who has ohio state teachers college um, insurance it's its own kind of like sub insurance through through a different kind of provider and it, it actually has unlimited skilled nursing facility day coverage I know. I was like, you gotta be, I know. That's right, because I was on a Zoom with the family. <laughs> I know, he, that's, the, that's just it. Those long ago policies were really good. Now it's bare bones coverage, so you have to look. And the other value is not only do you have the access to trusted professionals that we need to get on the team, but this is also a good exercise for your adult kids, because my client is the whole family. This is a good exercise for the kids because they're all probably in that 40, 50, 60 age group. They need to be thinking about their retirement, their grab and go binder, making sure they have all of their stuff in order because it's that bus. I did not expect to get hit by a bus and it, that stuff happens to adult kids and people in general. Yes. Are you saying that we should have duplicate copies of everything or we just copy what we have in Boston and I would do that. I have duplicate copies, so a binder, you know. I don't need to take, I mean, I have a living will, but it doesn't say anything about kids being. That doesn't do your kids any good unless they can get to the safe, and unless they have to fly down, again, then they have to fly down to get in the safe. So if we have to copy something, or we have the actual paper? So both the electronic version. So when I say electronic version, what most of the kids do is the moms and dads still like the paper, like the actual paper copy. But what most of the adult kids do is they scan it. So they have an electronic copy. Yep, because if your kids are traveling or they're in Ohio and you're down here, they're, yeah, and then they're gonna have to drive or fly somewhere to get to your binder, right? <laughs> so, and that's actually what happens because- but They just copy what I have and scan it on this one. Well, they make a whole, they make copies and you make a second binder. Right. Whatever's in your grab and go binder, you might. That's too bad if you can buy the binder. Well, you don't, you don't I would love you to, but <laughs> because it's a plug and play solution. But if you want to recreate the wheel and try to figure out what all you need to put in it, yeah. It's on the website. It's on the website. So the. We'll make sure you get it. Yeah. Yeah, you that that would that you have right there. That's my letterhead. So you'll see the website is on the bottom, www.carewriting.com. It's got my phone number and my email. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So what do you think? Did you learn some stuff? Yes. Was it worth your time? Was it worth your time? Okay, good. No. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so John, so John, I'm so glad, see, that's so cute that you care about him. So John was like totally freaked out because my face, because the bus, I broke it with a head, my, my face was bashed in is what I was trying to say. So I, because this happened over the noon hour in Sheboygan that we're all eating and drinking, well, they are, I'm not, I'm not work, but because it thankfully happened, I guess, thankfully happened over the noon hour, all these people saw it and they literally 18 people ran out and they're like, oh my God. And as I'm like getting myself up off the street and trying to figure out what happened, then they were like, you just got hit by a bus. I'm like, 
that makes so much more sense. <laughs> so anyway, because I do what I do for a living, and I know that you can have brain bleeds, and all of a sudden you can be alert, and then all of a sudden it's comatose. Literally, all of these 18 people, I gave them something to remember about me. Like, my name is Anna Lee. I'm a do not resuscitate and da da da. And so, John, so I give everybody a piece to piece of information in case I lose consciousness. I sit down on the curb and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna, I should sit down and wait for the paramedics to come. So I look up at John and his face is beat red, like beat red. And I'm like, oh my crap, he's going to have a heart attack or a stroke. And so he ended up in the paramedics with me because I was so worried about him. Because for like almost a minute, I could still talk. Like, but then because my face was so broken, then like the swelling happened and then I couldn't talk at all because I had broken jaws and stuff. So, um, but I was like, he just had to start, he just had heart stents put in and he's just like, I was so afraid he was going to go down for the count. And he was from Chicago. He was just, he was in Chicago and he took, he takes care of his daughter with Down syndrome. So I learned a lot about John. <laughs> and so I was like really worried because I'm like, he probably doesn't have a grab and go binder in if he's the caregiver to a daughter with Down syndrome. I know a lot goes through my head. <laughs> and I'm like, he probably doesn't have a binder. And because I practice what I preach in my purse, I carry my living will and my healthcare power of attorney and my do not resuscitate. So when I got hit by the bus and I gave all these 18 people something to remember in case I need, in case I was comatose, before I, because I was so afraid I was going to lose consciousness, I literally pulled out of my backpack. Um, my living will, my power of attorney, and the phone numbers to my family. And then Mary Ann in the back of the, she was the paramedic. She's like, I've been a paramedic for 30 years. I've never had anybody produce their documents. She said, I wish everybody did that because it makes their job easier. Which I mentioned this is when I talked about the New York versus yeah. the stuff here. Yeah. Before I took it to New York to give to my daughter, I had it in the closet in the guest room, which I then was told that is a useless place. Right. Because Fire. the paramedics come, they're taking me out. And those papers should be duplicated so that they're on your refrigerator. Refrigerators where they usually will look. Um, and also, if there's a fire, you're just burning up all your documents. So I call it the grab and go, not only for medical crises, but but like when we had Hurricane Irma, I took off because I just had moved down here. And I'm like, look, I'm used to tornadoes, but like a Hurricane four, like whatever the category four, or whatever. So I literally grabbed my grab and go binder because for me to have to call all the insurance, I have multiple life insurance. I have disability insurance. I mean, I just have a lot of insurance because, well, it's smart. So for me to have to, for me to have to call all those providers and wait an hour and a half to get through to talk to an actual person to get my policies again, it's just so much smarter to just have it all, make sure it's in a fire safe area so i keep mine in my freezer because it's just me so <laughs> so i keep my mine in my freezer i have my do not resuscitate yellow sheet because here in florida that's how it's done your yellow do not resuscitate tape to my tape to my refrigerator i learned that too that it's got a special yellow piece of tape bright yellow it has to be bright yellow um and then because i switched doctors my doctor down here retired so I had to switch doctors. I made sure that she had all my living will, my power of attorney, the HIPAA documents, so that if something happens to me, my family can check in on me and they can share information. And because when I moved here, I had Wisconsin advanced directives, the living will and power of attorney, but they're not the same. Because Florida, like seven, eight years ago, changed, I think the Florida bar changed the format, the document format down here. So when I moved down here, I got all of my documents for Florida updated and got those over to the physician too. But it's, whatever you can do proactively is going to make your life and your family's life much, much easier. Have you heard of the SNAP 911 on your phone? Yeah, you mean the ICE in case of emergency? No, no. the SMART 911. It's like your medical information. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. It's updated on the phone and the paramedics. Um, if you have the help. Um, yep. App. Yep. Can access your. Um, your doctor. Your records. Information. Yeah. Yep. I don't know if you've ever. I haven't used that before. And so here's the thing. I have, on my caseload, I have people who are in their 50s and 60s because they have MS or Parkinson's, you know, and that strikes younger. 
but then I had people in their 90s and 100, and the 90s and 100 year olds, they're all about paper, right? So, yeah. <laughs> so I have a very caseload of, and some people are much more comfortable with the online apps and stuff like that, and a lot of people aren't just because in case they get hacked. Good questions, good dialogue, engagement. Any other questions? Does anybody want to sign up for a free consult? You want to schedule that? If you do, either see me or write your name down. There should be a notebook going around. Okay, so if you want a free consult, put your name down or put a star by it. Otherwise, I can add you to the newsletter list as well. So does anybody want a consult at this point? Yeah, that's typical these days. Yeah, I did say to one of them, I know, and that's so sweet to say that. <laughs> and it can work temporarily as long as you're healthy and able bodied. But once, when I'm thinking because 900 square foot apartment in New York City. Get them all quick. Yeah, I know. And that's so great when adult kids offer that, but and it can work temporarily, but it's definitely not a long term solution. No, there isn't a good long term solution if he gets sick. If you I don't want any help with any help. All right. Well, very good. Thank you, everybody, for coming today. <laughs> Thank you. And you're, you're welcome. My brother. You know, was single and living in get Mexico and was really good. Yeah. 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 Yeah.